Hello, this is Rick Harnish, uh, Executive Director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we've got a really exciting program and uh, I wanna thank you for coming. Uh, for those who are new to the Alliance, uh, we are supported by uh, primarily individual contributions. Um, and our goal is to help people uh, throughout the country um, understand what high speed and regional rail and inter-regional rail are, how they all work together, um, why it's critical and urgent that we expand fast, frequent and passenger trains now um, across the country um, in what individuals like yourselves can do to help uh, make it happen. Um, so again, thank you for coming. Um, we've got an exciting program in front of us. So North Carolina has been a tremendous leader in developing passenger rail over the years um, with uh, significant innovations in uh, the sealed corridor approach. Um, they own the railroad and have um, a long-term vision uh, for how to upgrade that steadily over time in order to create significant um, impacts for the communities online. Um, and also, uh, they're in basically the middle of what the Federal Railroad has identified as a high potential for a new high-speed rail corridor linking New York uh, to Atlanta. And um, that would be really great if, if we could get uh, a much quicker implementation of that. Uh, but I want to thank Jason Orthner for joining us today. He's the Rail Division Director at the North Carolina Department of Transportation uh, to go over uh, briefly what their vision is and what steps they are taking. If you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer, not the chat. So for questions, use the question and answer, um, and then we'll get to those questions after the presentation. So Jason, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and feel free to take it away. Thank you, Rick. I just need to make sure that I can share my screen. I feel like I, I lost that capability here. Are you able to see my uh, my presentation? Yes. So for a while, we saw what looked like a nice tent, but uh, <laughs> we're seeing your presentation. Absolutely. You can see it now. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to those that are in, on the West Coast. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, and talk a little bit about what we're doing here in North Carolina. Uh, it's exciting to be part of a, a, a nationwide conversation uh, during this time where rail, I think, is getting more attention and more interest uh, perhaps than it has in a many, many, many years, decades, in fact. So uh, what we're doing here in North Carolina is, is certainly exciting. Uh, I'll get right into it. Uh, so, um, I'll start just by the mission of our division. So we're actually a North Carolina DOT rail division is a division within the, the um, Department of Transportation here in North Carolina. And uh, we are one of the larger divisions uh, of our kind across the country. Um, we have a mission statement uh, and it's grounded in sort of our three uh, major programs that we oversee. And that is uh, passenger services, uh, freight services and uh, and safety programs uh, across our, our state. So um, we are a team of about 47 uh, full-time um, state employees, and uh, we have at least that many, if not double that, uh, contractors who are uh, regular contributors to our program. Uh, but the, our goal really is to uh, support the movement of freight passengers over the, our state's rail system um, connect them better to other modes of transportation, but also to support job creation and economic growth in all that we do. Uh, the state's rail system is uh, a, a large one. We have a pretty good resource here in North Carolina, 30, around 3,600 miles, quarter miles of active rail uh, corridors uh, across uh, North Carolina. Uh, operates in 86 of our 100 counties. Uh, and um, our division is connected with really all of the owners and users of this system. Uh, we have about 25 short line railroads here in our state, uh, two class ones, Norfolk Southern and CSX. And uh, of course we have Amtrak as a, as, as a passenger service provider, as well as um, another real critical important 
an important par partner to us, the North Carolina River Company that owns the corridor between Charlotte and Moorhead City, about 317 miles there. Um, uh, that is an interesting uh, uh, organization. North Carolina Railroad Company is a as a private company, wholly uh, owned by the state, um, and uh, they are not an agency, but they we do a lot of a lot of coordination with them on the use of their uh, very strategic asset, uh, advancing rail programs here in North Carolina. A little bit more about our division. Um, we have a lot of uh, structure in our organization that's geared towards project delivery and operations. Um, we have everything from planning and development of, of systems here um, on the freight side, the passenger side, as well as uh, the necessary uh, planning and environmental documentation to support those, those efforts, um, as well as uh, a full a full fledged design and construction group and in our engineering uh, uh, design and construction a team that is uh, focused on project delivery, uh, supporting our high, our statewide highway uh, projects, uh, the statewide road crossing uh, um, uh, efforts uh, with warning devices and crossing closures. Uh, we we also support statewide rail safety and working with FRA and railroad and our uh, railroad oversight um, of all the disciplines there, as well as transit rail based transit oversight. Um, and then uh, obviously in operations facilities, we are a, uh, a sponsor of passenger rail service. And so we have, uh, we own terminals, uh, we own, um, we work with communities on stations, uh, we own rail corridors, and um, we do all of the different functionality there to support those activities. We actually own uh, 32 pieces of active railroad equipment in support of the Piedmont passenger rail service, which I'll get into here in a little bit more uh, detail. Um, and um, it is a it's a very interesting and exciting time to be in the business. So we have uh, a pretty large uh, network. I would call it a starter system here of passenger rail system in North Carolina. Um, we've been at this now for 32 years and supporting passenger rail service. But our map today really has uh, a lot of robust service between our two largest urban centers, uh, Raleigh and Charlotte. Uh, and points in between um, that it, we have really uh, five round trips a day on that and on that service as well as connecting uh, long distance Amtrak services with the Crescent with the Silver Star uh, with the um, the Palmetto and and the Silver Meteor uh, all operating through our state um, and then we sponsor daily service by the Carolinian between Charlotte and New York um, over that same quarter, Charlotte to um, Raleigh, and it makes the turn at Selma to go up the Rocky Mountain up to DC that way. Uh, we have some connecting uh, throughway uh, bus services here in the state in the eastern North Carolina uh, component and also some shuttle services connecting Winston-Salem to the network. Uh, I will say this is, um, I called it the starter kit because it does not reach all places in North Carolina, which is really the vision uh, that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we've been at this for a while. So 1990 was when we first started our first state-sponsored passenger rail service, and that was the Carolinian operating daily between Charlotte and New York. Um, that was uh, uh, stood up, you know, following a, a governor's rail task force. Um, that uh, recommended implementation of that service at that time. Um, and then we geared up to start our Piedmont service um, uh, with a target date of 1995, uh, making several improvements to the corridor between, specifically between Raleigh and Charlotte to improve safety, but through grade crossing um, warning device uh, seal quarter program. Um, and then we entered a period of time where we were working with the North Carolina Railroad Company on some additional improvements uh, called the North Carolina Railroad Improvement Program, uh, adding passing sightings uh, signals uh, on, on some of the route that was dark um, and uh, some double track between uh, in, in the Greensboro area, uh, as well as some other improvements. And then in 2010, we received a significant amount of federal funding under through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to begin sort of the major Piedmont Improvement Program, which is a $520 million uh, federally funded program to really just change the way that Raleigh to Charlotte uh, service uh, react, um, uh, it performs. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. All the while, we've been introducing frequencies on in an incremental basis uh, with us now at five round trips a day. 
Um, so it, it has taken a while for us to get here, but the um, exponential nature of what we're doing is, is certainly uh, on the uphill climb. Um, one of the best stories I have as the director here at North Carolina is the fact that ridership is at record levels. Um, 2022 uh, was our highest ridership uh, year ever in 32 years with over uh, 522,000 passengers between the Carolina and, and Piedmont services. Um, that trend has not stopped. You can see here um, that obviously during the, the pandemic, we dropped down to uh, our lowest uh, uh, level of, of ridership ever at 100, about 180,000 in, in 2020. Um, but in 2023, we've already um, eclipsed 22 by a 28% increase in ridership over the over the first half of that year. Um, so the trend is certainly continuing and people are using the mode uh, more than they really ever have before. So it's a great story. It's a great uh, way for us to uh, talk about the benefit passenger rides to our state and why it should receive uh, additional investment. Um, now on July 10th of this year, we started that fifth train. Um, up until that point, we were running, um, we were operating four round trips between Raleigh and Charlotte. Um, this particular table only shows you the Raleigh to Charlotte uh, times, it does not show the Carolinian service, which goes off page uh, to go to, to, to receive uh, passengers to and from New York, Washington, Richmond, and places in between. Um, but it does show you the level of robustness that we've been able to achieve under the program uh, to date uh, with train service throughout the day and uh, some services um, with, with um, more limited stops to provide a faster trip between Raleigh and Charlotte, an under three hour trip, it's 175 miles. Um, so it's an average speed of about 58 to 60 miles an hour, pretty good, even with four stops in between. One of the other things that we're doing right now um, that is a, a major um, initiative of ours is the um, uh, Charlotte station. Uh, moving to uh, um, moving to Charlotte Station in, in Charlotte. That's it's actually the busiest uh, station in North Carolina and, and the busiest station south of um, Staples Mill in Richmond. Um, it, it's a very undersized station right now. Um, uh, the legacy from the 1960s when uh, passenger operators were, were moving stations out out of into suburban locations as opposed to having them in the downtown area. Um, and uh, it's undersized, it floods, um, it, it's inaccessible in a lot of ways, um, and it miss, it's really missing an opportunity here to do something significant in, in our largest city in North Carolina. Um, so we have just this past year finished um, the, uh, all the rail side infrastructure for a new, new platform, high level platform in downtown Charlotte that will connect to a major redevelopment here. You can see in the picture how, what kind of proximity it has to the, to the uh, central business district. Um, it is, uh, we finished it on time and on budget last year. And uh, we're looking forward to working with the city's developer uh, to create sort of this multi-story, multi-use um, development here. Uh, that will really be a destination unto itself. Um, and uh, that targeted completion for that station is between is around 2026 to 2027. Um, another thing that's happening in North Carolina, we successfully brought uh, Siemens um, Mobility's uh, intercity passenger rail uh, manufacturing facility uh, to uh, Lexington, North Carolina, the center of our state and along the, uh, the corridor. Um, that is a major development for us as we look to expand beyond just our core services to, to additional services. Um, and uh, this facility, we certainly believe will uh, support the aero train set manufacturing. Um, the facility itself is over 500 jobs. So it really got a lot of the interest of, of um, uh, the most executive levels within our state. Um, and uh, we're excited about having this capability here in North Carolina and, and feeding uh, the uh, the industry as a whole with with modern passenger rail equipment. So, I'll focus more now on sort of the uh, the major corridor project that we're working on. Um, many of you probably have heard of uh, the S line, uh, and I'll take I'll, I'll go through the next several slides and talk about you know what that project is and what it's doing. Um, the main thing that I want to communicate is that we've got robust systems in North Carolina connecting Raleigh and Charlotte 
And then uh, Virginia has a tremendously robust program uh, connecting uh, not just the Tidewater, Richmond, and, and D.C. area, but also uh, heading west out to some of their other communities like Lynchburg, Roanoke, and, and Charlottesville. Uh, what is missing is, is, a, is a connection, a high-speed, high-frequency, high-reliability connection uh, between those two systems uh, to create a southeast network. Um, we have the Carolinian service, which is the uh, only train service that's connecting these two systems um, with, in any kind of real way today. There's some long distance service as well. Um, and that Carolinian service is one of the most successful uh, services uh, in the system. It, it uh, did well during the pandemic. It is um, at record ridership levels now coming out of the pandemic. Uh, and shows that there's a tremendous amount of demand for that train, even with it having kind of a circuitous route um, that, as you can see here in this map, it dips down to Selma and Rocky Mountain back up. Um, and uh, this new route over the S-Line will be a much more direct, fast route. So um, Transforming Rail in Virginia is what Virginia calls their program. Um, we finished in 2017 the Piedmont Improvement Program, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, what's missing is the connection between. And that is, uh, we're developing that in partnership with Virginia, um, with FRA and other, and Amtrak and other partners um, to, uh, to get to see that connection come to fruition. A little bit about the Piedmont Improvement Program. Um, this is the $520 million um, investment by uh, FRA in, uh, during the AIR program. Um, we delivered this project also on time and on budget, included, um, about 35 miles of, of, double of double track, either by siding or double track, um, rail equipment, train station improvements, the closure of 40 at-grade crossings, um, the realignment of the railroad, the construction of new high-speed uh, crossover, 60-mile-an-hour crossovers. Um, and the result of this program was allowing us to add the additional uh, Piedmont round trips between Raleigh and Charlotte. So um, this was a major program that we delivered on time and on budget. It really gives us a substantial amount of uh, um, indication that we can be successful with the big program linking Raleigh and Richmond together. Um, it was managed directly here by the rail division. Um, and we worked with all the parties here at DOT to, to deliver it, including our division of highways. And uh, very exciting project, great results that, are, that we're living today because of the, the expanded service that we have. Um, looking beyond, you know, looking at the region as a whole, um, the D.C. to Charlotte corridor has is a, uh, a mega region with major population centers and density uh, up and down it. Um, right now, it represents about 20 million people, um, as you can see by the urban areas around D.C., Richmond and the, and the Tidewater area. And then as you get into North Carolina, the Triangle area represented by Dur Raleigh and Durham. Uh, triad, which is the Greensburg, Winston-Salem, High Point area, and then Charlotte region, um, all growing at significant rates uh, here. Um, and this 20 million people is expected to grow to 25 million by 2040 in this region. And connectivity um, is, a, is a big uh, thing that we're thinking about, um, especially as we look at um, folks moving around in non-vehicular ways. Um, and uh, folks that don't have access to, to a vehicle or just want to remain productive uh, in, in their transportation mode. Um, so this, what this project does is it adds capacity and it adds over an hour in travel time, say, between North Carolina and Virginia. Um, that's both by the design speed and by the, um, by the, uh, um, the fact that it's a shorter route. Uh, the, the route will become a backbone of regional multimodal network. Um, it is absolutely critical for us to get this capacity to further expand our, our intrastate uh, rail, intercity rail system that I'll talk about here in a little bit. It also provides uh, freight network resiliency um, and environmental benefits uh, that, that, are, that come you know, with rail to go without saying, I'm sure that are familiar to the, the alliance here. Um, and then, of course, one of our talking points is expand service to dis disadvantaged and underserved regions, specifically through rural areas of North Carolina and Virginia. Um, we've been working on the S-Line for a long time. Um, 
just to give a, as a as a point of context, um, the line actually what represents uh, or was a main line of of CSX up until the late eighties. Um, it was the Seaboard Airline Railroad's main line connecting uh, Raleigh, uh, Petersburg, and Richmond, um, and it was uh, taken out as it would, north of uh, a place called uh, Ridgeway or Norlina. Uh, the track was actually uh, pulled up. It's about 70 miles of track that was pulled up in that area. And then south of um, Norlina to Raleigh, it was um, downgraded to a, a 25 mile an hour uh, freight line. So um, that is its existing condition. Um, very different from, you know, when it used to host, you know, uh, 20 to 40 freight trains and passenger trains a day um, in the in between the 40s and the 60s. So very um very much an opportunity. We identified that opportunity in the 90s. Um, we um, immediately started working with our partners in Virginia and with FRA uh, and, and in DC to begin a tier one um, environmental analysis. Um, and we reached record decision on that in 2002. That, that analysis selected the route um, over uh, the S line uh, versus other routes, um, including the A line route through Weldon uh, and Selma. And then we proceeded immediately from there to a tier two process um, that would um, evaluate the S line quarter, the 162 miles of S line quarter, in a much more detailed fashion. Um, clearing it environmentally for basically right of way and construction. So that process took a long time, uh, involved 162 miles of uh, rail corridor analysis and, and lots of alternative uh, routes along that along that 162 miles, as well as uh, 82 miles of, of roadway system analysis, um, because the goal was to separate uh, the roadway network from the rail network. Um, we began uh, to apply for uh, grants for uh, right of way. Uh, in 2020, we won uh, a $48 million Chrissy grant uh, to for the quarter purchase um, in North Carolina from CSX. And then in 2022, uh, us along with Virginia's Passenger Rail Authority won a $58 million Chrissy grant uh, to do 30% engineering survey and preliminary engineering over the whole 162 miles of rail and 82 miles of roadway. Um, that really set the process uh, going forward. So where we are right now is um, we have NEPA complete, which is obviously a major milestone uh, finished on the project. Uh, we have quarter acquisition underway. Virginia has actually already completed acquisition or in, in the very last last stages of their acquisition uh, from CSX down to uh, down to uh, north, around Norlina. Um, North Carolina is in the very last stages of our, our, of our acquisition with CSX from North Carolina into Raleigh. Um, we have already done the detailed surveying uh, and, uh, and aerial photography for the route uh, in preparation for the engineering. Um, we have uh, got tremendous uh, community engagement ongoing with all the communities up and down, up and down the corridor. Um, we have... Uh, through that 30% engineering grant from FRA, we've already onboarded the, the PEFs for the for the design, uh, and uh, we're, we're get, beginning that process now. Uh, and then, of course, submitting submitting grants, as I know many of the folks on this uh, webinar probably understand, uh, that is the game to actually you know build things. Uh, we are um, we've been submitting grants. Uh, we submitted under Chrissy. Uh, um, I think it was actually 22 for a 60% engineering right of way uh, grant and then Fed State Partnership um, FY 22 and 23 to do the first phase of, of actual construction on the route uh, on the complicated uh, urban area system, part of the system between Raleigh and Wake Forest. Um, we've submitted the, the, this as part of the Charlotte to DC um, uh, uh, quarter under, under the FRS quarter ID program. And we are prepping for um, the next Fed State partnership as well uh, to submit the, an additional line segments going north from Wake Forest. So uh, a tremendous amount of activity going on on this on this project uh, as we build north. Um, really excited about this project. It is um, it 
we, we would characterize it as one of the most technologically advanced railroads in the southeast. That's what we're trying to build. Um, you know, we don't have a northeast corridor down here yet, although we have some very um, good looking freight corridors. But this will be something special for us um, building uh, or rebuilding this corridor the right way uh, with design speeds in the range of 110 to 125. Uh, gr grade separations uh, to the tune of 91 new grade separations, uh, a concrete tie railroad um, track infrastructure um, using higher speed switches, high level platforms uh, to allow for fast and uh, ADA uh, compatible boarding, uh, freight bypass tracks. Uh, this will be a shared corridor um, as, as CSX will continue to have a, the common carrier obligation here for local traffic. So building freight bypass tracks around the, that infrastructure where clearance uh, requirements are an issue. Um, installing the positive train control and advanced signal systems uh, to make sure that this can operate at the speeds that we uh, we intend for it to, to do. Um, we have an aggressive conceptual delivery schedule. Um, obviously this is uh, subject to uh, receive a funding but because NEPA is complete and because we have line of sight of the 30% engineering, uh, we're looking at the most aggressive schedule possible to actually deliver the construction of the project with an initial focus on the uh, Raleigh to Petersburg segment where it will link back up to the uh, existing network um, that Virginia has. Um, so right of way acquisition, construction of that segment, and then operation of that segment is the initial uh, real focus with a second phase uh, focusing on the uh, Petersburg to uh, Richmond Main Street, um, downtown Richmond location, uh, being sort of the second piece of this um, to create the fully integrated corridor. Um, the, the goal of this, of this program really is to have continu contiguous um, high technology, um, high capacity network from DC all the way into Charlotte, ext essentially extending the Northeast corridor uh, all the way and, and through a Southeast uh, component all the way to Charlotte, essentially doubling uh, the length of the Northeast corridor. One of the things that we are working on as well um, with this is not is, is ensuring it's not just a corridor program, but it is a, um, we have, an integration with the communities. So uh, our sister agency or a sister, sister division here in North Carolina called the Integrated Mobility Division is also working with uh, communities up and down the S line to ensure that uh, they are ready for uh, this rail project to come into their community. And so they're looking at ways that for the, those communities that are planning for uh, station access, um, that they do it in, in the form of a mobility hub where they can bring lots of different types of tr transportation uh, components together in one location at, this, at, at the station um, and even have those elements ready uh, even prior to a station being there. So it's pretty exciting. We've been working very closely with seven communities uh, on this effort. Um, it's as much a, a rural and a small town uh, effort as it is an urbanized larger town effort. And it's given a, the communities a real way to um, uh, tie into the project, to own the project, and, and feel like it, the project is really doing something for them. And so I, I'm almost here at the end of my presentation, but this is probably one of the most exciting slides that I show to people around our state. Um, the S-Line corridor is critical to um, feeding the Southeast. It's critical to feeding the no North Carolina and North Carolina's uh, intercity passenger rail system. We've submitted 12 corridors to the uh, quarter ID program uh, that will extend our passenger rail footprint in North Carolina to as far west in the mountains as Asheville and as far east as the beaches in Wilmington and Moorhead City and lots of places in between. Um, this program, um, and or at least the opportunity that it provides has created lots of conversation about um, ensuring that the state as a whole can tie into uh, this idea of expanded passenger rail system. It doesn't just serve uh, certain communities in, in, around our state, um, but it serves a wider uh, amount of populations and interests. So um, these corridors have, have really um, 
grown a lot of interest. The communities are really engaged on this process and are looking forward to the further discussions that we'll, we will have with uh, all of our partners, including, importantly, our freight railroad partners um, who are critical. Uh, that coordination and that relationship is going to be critical to discovering, you know, where we can find success. I do want to mention uh, two uh, governance structures that exist. Uh, one is the Virginia North Carolina High Speed Rail uh, Interstate High Speed Rail Compact. Um, we have, this was actually created in 2004 pursuant to federal legislation. Uh, we had legislation in both uh, general assemblies pass, um, creating the body with five members from each state, elected officials, and, and other members from each state. Uh, with the inaugural meeting held in uh, 2010. Um, the coordination and the body is really critical to advancing our, the, the multi-state project, especially, specifically the SLAM project that crosses state borders. Um, and then it's staffed by um, DOT and uh, Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation uh, um, personnel to support uh, the efforts of the compact. Um, but uh, it's exciting to have this body uh, and engaged elected officials working uh, with us to um, advance transportation and you know across state lines. Uh, the other body uh, that also is um, represented is a, a Southeast Quarter Commission um, that is the uh, organization, a, a, a different organization, not in state law, but but uh, but it does have um, uh, an agreement between the states um, through bylaws to have seven states. Uh, D.C., Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, working together uh, to align our freight and passenger interests, uh, position us, you know, for federal funding, and uh, and broaden the uh, geographic footprint of of what is now the Virginia North Carolina Compact. Um, so, uh, my Deputy Secretary Julie White actually uh, chairs this commission along with. Um, Vice Chair by um, with General De Brule in North in uh, Virginia, uh, for Depart DRPT, and uh, the Treasurer or Secretary for um, is uh, Meg Perkle, who's the Chief Engineer with the Georgia DOT. So it's a pretty interesting, very diverse group of of um, states that remain uh, very engaged and working together. And with that, uh, Rick, I uh, really appreciate the time of. Um, the folks, you know, listening in on the webinar and would be happy to take some questions. Yeah, great. And if you could uh, unshare your screen. Sure. Um, as an aside, before we go any further, I want to tell a story about uh, my friend Theo, who got a t-shirt, <laughs> High Speed Rail Alliance t-shirt. And over the weekend, he was at a farmer's market and was talking about how as he was walking down the farmer's market, everybody was saying, yes, I want high-speed rail. And then you can tell them, we'll join the high-speed rail alliance. So what I would like the members of the, the uh, audience to do today is get themselves a high-speed rail t-shirt uh, by going to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just spaced out, hsrail.org slash shirts and you can see how to get a t-shirt there um, and that's uh, again we're fully supported by our members um, and and that's what allows us to have really valuable conversations like this today so hsrail.org slash shirts is the place to go um the, a lot of questions came up that i have and that others have um so i want to start with the um the integrated mobility hubs. And can you tell me more about how that's structured and, and if there's any challenges in getting the communities truly engaged in that? That's a great question. Um, so we uh, actually, what, the way that that worked is we received a grant from the FTA uh, for, for a transit-oriented development um, study. Um, we fostered uh, the relationship with these with these communities, and they created basically an S line uh, uh, group uh, with chairs uh, of that group, um, uh, in basically anchored in sort of the northern and southern components of the of the S line, but both sort of the smaller towns. Um, through that engagement, 
they all contributed funding to support, you know, the idea of, um, you know, what this could be. And they created basically the, the, the enough local funding to match the TOD grant. And then uh, our integrated mobility division basically kind of uh, worked with those communities through that process uh, to, to, you know, kind of vision. You, one of my slides I was showing kind of a placemaking picture where there's a lot of that kind of, you know, thing going on. You know, how does this rail fit into the community and how does their community develop around it? Created some very exciting conversations for, you know, for these communities to see that, you know, beyond just that old rickety, you know, 25 mile an hour, you know, railroad track, uh, that was, you know, in their town, and then, and then to kind of uh, blend that with development opportunity and this idea of, you know, the station being more than a parking lot and a platform, but being a place that the community actually, you know, that can be centered in the community that can bring all the different types of transportation, whether it's transit, microtransit, uh, active transportation, which is, you know, biking, walking, scooters, uh, you name it, bicycle and pedestrian, uh, into one location, you know, with some with some um, other activation through businesses, you know, to really create a place. And that idea is very exciting to these communities. And I don't know, uh, you know, normal is frequently brought up as an example of that working very well. I was down there a couple of weeks ago, and it's it's really a huge transformation in Champaign. So I'm glad to see that that's starting off as part of the process. Um, it's a little tangential, but it, I just went and saw the Cleveland Greyhound station yesterday, which is at risk of being torn down. Right. And I'm continuing to be very concerned about the future of inner city bus in this country. Is Does the state have a program for having connecting buses and having them work together? That's a great question. So, um, that is part of our relationship with our integrated mobility division. They they were for, they formally named uh, our public transportation division and bike and ped division. It was but they that was merged. So part of their oversight is both um, urban bus systems or you know or systems you know that are local systems as well as inner city bus and. Um, we have some authorities that actually uh, operate buses over longer distances that, you know, more regional bus systems as well. So all of that, all of that kind of connecting transportation is part of the vision for um, these uh, mobility hubs. And I'm not just talking about the S line, but also the stations that we serve today. Um, I will say that um, it, we are also having conversations with Amtrak about throughway bus service, you know, basically connecting shuttle service. Uh, to extend uh, to extend our inner city passenger rail network beyond just I think my map showed the uh, eastern North Carolina services that connect to our system in Wilson, North Carolina. We're looking at more of those those types of opportunities as well. Excellent, excellent. And then, so going to the top of my back to the beginning, um, uh, I've always been interested by the North Carolina Railroad, and you mentioned it is a separate entity. And I always assumed there was some type of tie-in, but um, how is that relate? How do you relate to that? How's that governed? And then, does is Norfolk Southern actually running it, or how does that all work? That's a good question. So, and, and it's a complex one. Um, so, a couple of things about the North Carolina Railroad Company. Uh, I, I believe they're the oldest active corporation in North Carolina. Uh, originally chartered in 1849. And they were a uh, an organization institution of our General Assembly at that time, uh, and one of the first and really the first east west railroad in our state to connect sort of our ma major population centers. It was stood up for transportation and economic development. It has basically uh, existed in that kind of form uh, for the last 170 years. Um, and what the, they're not an operating railroad. They are. They are. They they hold the asset and lease it right now to Norfolk Southern uh, for as the, for the as the operating entity. You know for their th their 317 mile uh, current quarter. Um, so Norfolk Southern has a lease. It's time bound, um, and but uh, it's, it has very specific you know sort of requirements with regards to operations, maintenance, and uh, 
and uh, other types of things. All the assets, all the tri all the on property assets are owned by North Carolina Railroad Company. Um, so uh, truly Norfolk Southern is an operator in, in that case. Um, but the state, um, the, the board of the North Carolina Railroad Company is appointed by uh, a blend of the governor and the two houses of the General Assembly. So there, that is the one sort of one point of um, connection, if you will, from the state and the operations of the, of the railroad. So then um, when the state purchases this, the segment of the S line, um, who will own that? Great question. So uh, right now, uh, the the effort is uh, we have a grant from the FRA to um, to uh, own the own or to to go through the process of purchasing the corridor. Um, and that is the direction we're going on. We're going in uh, the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority in Virginia owns their portion of that corridor. So they own sort of the northern portion and we're in the process of of, uh, of acquiring uh, the southern portion as a, as a asset of the state. OK, so that would be owned by the state and then uh, CSX will have the freight rights still and then who dispatches it. Well, that's a good question. I mean, that's 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 uh, to 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 remain uh, determined exactly whose dispatches. Uh, you know, there um, certainly Amtrak will have a very in, a large interest in here as as a as a an operating entity. Um, but there, but that scenario is is one of a couple that you know that we could where we're exploring as far as um, you know the uh, operation of the railroad. And then we have. Um... I'm very much in favor of figuring out how to electrify freight railroads. Um, and I know that they believe it's not practical, but in your view, what does it take to get this quarter electric? That is a uh, several billion dollar question. Um, so um, one, one thing I will say from our perspective is we're sensitive to the clearance requirements of the freight railroads. Um, and you know, know that 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 is largely what drives you know their you know sort of their their concerns with you know electrification of, of their networks. Um, it is not precluded, obviously, in this project. It was not electrification was not an, a, a component of um, uh, of the of the NEPA, so it's not cur currently a project element of the of the project. However. Um, there is a future where uh, portions could be electrified. Um, I'll also say this, you know, in working with the FRA through the Piedmont Improvement Program and, and um, um, in other things, you know, we we assured that our bridge, our overhead bridges that we built, the highway bridges were built with the um, clearance requirements in mind for overhead electrification. So there is that element. We are doing some uh, sort of early planning to make sure that we we thought through that um, when and if it comes. That's good news. Um, now, Georgia did a tier one for a new high-speed line between Charlotte and Atlanta. That's correct. How does that interact with the, the north part that you described? No, that's a great question. So. Uh, that study, uh, you know, basically landed on a greenfield alignment between Charlotte, Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, the interface is at Charlotte. I will say that FRA uh, very keenly interested in both programs and put a lot of thought into our um, development of the Charlotte Gateway Station and the surrounding infrastructure to make sure that we had capacity envisioned, you know, for, for the interface between the two uh, systems. Um, that, you know, obviously the way those interface, you know, is, remains to be determined, but, you know, it could be end to end, it could be passed through, um, those kinds of questions still need to be uh, determined as that project matures, you know, and, and gets a little further along. So, uh, this may be esoteric and too much, but I was at a, uh, you know, the FRA is doing that long distance study, talking about long distance trains, and they were talking about governance. Um, and I was reminded at that moment that in 1918, plus or minus, uh, the federal government said to the states, if you want, now this was 1918, most people think about the interstate highway system, which was similar. If you want our money, you will hire these engineers and you will build this type of road in these places. They didn't say, 
you'd have to form an interstate compact. They didn't say, you got to come up with your own plan, right? And so we've got this quarter from New York to Atlanta that you're doing really exciting work. Georgia's doing cool work. Virginia's doing really great stuff. But are they, how do we work better to make sure that actually happens? Or can the state start advocating for there should be a real federal program that's connecting all these things together? Well, what your point is well taken. I will say that the commission uh, does have these types of conversations and is, and is working uh, to make sure that um, that discussion is happening. FRA also uh, has been leading a, an effort uh, for the southeast region, ensuring that there is a, there there is a plan and, and connectivity between uh, the various initiatives um, as as they move forward, and of course they do have a, a lot of say because they're a major funder uh, in the various programs um, that would develop the system. Um, you know, in the various organizations that you know advocate for um, you know passenger rail. Um, you know, this, this, we're still kind of early in this process. The IIJA did a lot for the, for the, for, you know, rail and in, in actually providing substantial funding. Um, it is still through discre largely discretionary grant programs, which means, you know, you, you're going to get pieces and parts. The, the quarter ID program may be the first real test of, you know, do you actually start to see something come about where you've got more definitive planning, um, you know, for a multi state corridors? Um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, was the first step in like a win, you know, moving towards, you know, um, a, a, um, a funding and development paradigm that, that, that provides consistent funding more on a formula basis, you know, in the future, um, so that there can be more consistent, coordinated, well-planned systems. Um, but that is, in fact, the challenge, you know, that uh, that we're all working with. Well, yeah, you've got the problem that there's a couple of billion dollars every 10 years doesn't really do much. You need something that's consistent and ongoing. Um, and that's kind of our driving purpose here is to get public support for that ongoing uh, program. Um, so. Uh, uh, well, I'll just I'll go to, uh, so Joshua is asking about new train sets. So you talked about the Siemens plant, uh, but what is the plan for, for getting new train sets for the new, or to replace the what's there and get new, new trains running? That's a good point. Uh, so um, we're working closely uh, with Amtrak right now. Um, their Amtrak Aero program will do a lot, you know, for the Southeast and replacing uh, most of the train sets there. Uh, including our Carolinian service, um, which is supposed to come online and um, with new equipment in the 27, uh, 26, late 26, early 27 time period. Um, and then from there, we're looking at replacing the Piedmont equipment as well. Um, what I will say is that, you know, we, we have been limping along with 1950s and 60s equipment, you know, for a lot of, for you know, our Piedmont service for a long time. I think the future is certainly look, leaning towards modern, high technology, efficient equipment. And it is wonderful to have the plant that's going to build a lot of this, this type of uh, um, new equipment right here in North Carolina. So we fully expect to see us lean in uh, to that opportunity going forward. Yeah, I was really excited to hear about that, to, to know that Siemens is, is so uh, committed to the North yep. American market was very exciting. Um, uh, and then, so you talked about the people improvement program. Um, how did that change on time performance? And I think it, it part of it was additional frequencies, but right. was there a change in performance? Am I right? So uh, there is a focus, obviously, on on time performance. Built into that program was uh, an agreement, you know, with the various entities, including FRA, to. Uh, create sort of a performance standard for that system. Um, that is something that we monitor very closely. Um, it actually pre predates sort of the, you know, the metrics and standards sort of um, discussion that um, um, went after uh, we completed the program. But frequency, um, speed, on-time performance, all built into uh, the Piedmont Improvement Program. 
Uh, I will tell you that um, with our adjustment for the fifth frequency that we just did a few weeks ago, we're seeing great results as we kind of re reset the um, uh, passenger train schedules to really marry up well with both the infrastructure as well as Norfolk Southern's uh, freight train uh, scheduling. And we're seeing uh, well over 80 percent uh, on time performance uh, through those changes. So it's great. It's great to see uh, the results, you know, of the infrastructure really come about um, as we as we continue to do uh, further planning. That is a constant um, point of coordination and and um, communication between us and the railroad parties uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, it can take very small tweaks to have big results, you know, once you've got the infrastructure in place and those conversations are ongoing. Excellent. Uh, we've uh, been promoting recently much more aggressively the concept of regional rail, where the trains come every hour or every two hours, but always at the same time. And then that way you can better schedule connections with other modes, et cetera. Um, since the S line is, uh, will be largely have no freight, um, and you've done some good work on the, the uh, North Carolina railroad portion of it, um, what is it? Do you think that that can work where you've got interval schedules that are every hour, or every two hours? Or So, you know, I think. One of the things that's great about the S line project, exactly what you said, it is a very low, I mean, very low volume freight. Um, we do need to protect that operation, and that's built in sort of our coordination with with CSX. Um, but the opportunity for frequent service is is certainly there, you know, in in some form. Um, you know, we we have, you know. We have this idea, and I know this is familiar to, to you and your members of, you know, a quarter can provide lots of different types of service, you know, once you've got it built and developed. And um, as long as it's well coordinated, you know, between with the freight railroads and, and, and with the infrastructure and the, and the right agreements are in place, um, you can provide a variety of different services from, you know, limited stop to local trains to a regional, you know, kind of system like what you're describing. Um, those opportunities are certainly on front, front of mind for us. And, um, you know, we want to make sure as we develop the system that we're hitting the right markets with each product right correctly, um, that we're develop, delivering to those folks that want to go long distances, you know, and have lower travel, uh, you know, shorter travel times, that the, the product that they need, as well as, you know, um, as an eye towards the future with, you know, like you said, more frequent service and maybe service that serves more communities as well. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting, it, it, very tangential, but, um, you know, Germany is very rigid in their clock phase schedules, whereas next door, France just says, well, we've got trains that go really fast. So that means we can just run a couple of here and a couple of there and, and attract people. But it, um, you are right. One of the key tenets of railroads is they're very versatile and they can do a lot of different things, but you've got to invest in the infrastructure. But, you know, the reason that I'm in this is because of the impact on cities um, and communities. And I remember uh, I had a bad experience on a train platform in, in a tiny little town called Lincoln, Illinois. Um, but the train was very late. But suddenly a bunch of people showed up when the train was about to, when you know because they were checking when the train's coming and i said well this service is so part of integrated into this community that they know how to deal with the late trains right and it's not a, a uplifting story but that was one of the moments where i said these small towns and and medium-sized cities are so critical to this or the trains are so critical to them so Scott Rogers is promoting service for Eau Claire, which is bigger than Lincoln, um, but is wondering, um, you know, if if there's been any stories out of places like Kannapolis or Salisbury or Burlington uh, that help tell that story better. Well, that's a great point. You know, um, there is, you know, in a network. You have, and this is why I talk about the different products because 
you've got communities that are critical to serve that may have very low volume just because of population density or or and different you know travel needs for the, for their communities but um but are critical to make make sure that they're connected to the network um and uh you know that's a story that is uh, continuing you know we're we're looking at you know adding additional services in the future and looking at how what's the best pattern of of stopping for those trains but then, as you know, like you saw in the quarter ID map, um, you know, there, there are a lot more places that we're planning to take train services in the state. And that means that you're going to have different connections and different sequencing of trains and different places things need to go. And so we're going to have to con continually um, rejigger the scheduling and when trains operate to make sure those connections are, are made. Um, so it's a, it is a uh, dynamic an ongoing conversation, you know, as as uh, as we expand service. Well, so uh, I'm very excited about the California state rail plan, which is really unique because they actually figured out a statewide timetable for a date in the future so that they could work backwards and figure out what the most important stuff to build was now. Um, they were, you know, very focused on the interval timetables and getting everything connected at the same time. I'm not aware of anyone else in the U.S. doing that. Is that something that that might be done as part of your bigger network plan? I think it's I think it's a necessary component of the quarter ID program. Uh, you know, service development after the scoping of what the what the different quarters are, the service development plan is sort of the next step. And having an integrated service development plan, um, I think, is critical uh, to making sure the system operates well. Um, you know, we um, are careful not to commit on scheduling, um, you know, be, because there's so many other factors, I mean, for projects that are not really well known, I think, you know, yet, um, where on quarters where we have not done a, a large amount of, of coordination or the, or the, the really detailed coordination with our freight river partners, um, you know, but concepts and the development of that and then and then turn that into a conversation that is more coordinated through the quarter ID process I think is a a uh, necessary evolution uh, of the product I'm a I'm an engineer so I love detail I love having an actual schedule I also know that anything you do conceptually turns into something completely different uh, by the time you actually implement it um, and you know what's what what is important in those conversations is communicating that things will change, you know, um, over time and to not get folks buttoned down to very, very specific things until you actually, um, in, in my case, have the right decisions with the actual operating people at the, at that time, you know, and they're in delivering those schedules. Yeah. I, uh, uh, that thing about a war plan is always great until the battle starts. Right. <laughs> You have to do the plan, but it's not going to be what we came up with again. <laughs> um, I want to check real quick here. We've got a couple of minutes. If there's any um, airports, Roger Huff is asking about planning connections to airports. Yes, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, we um, there is interest in connections to. Um, uh, Charlotte Douglas, um, which is about four miles uh, south of the end of our of our endpoint, current endpoint on our line, but we're looking at quarter ID opportunities that might extend service there. Um, there's uh, in in the Raleigh Durham area, um, there is potential connectivity, um, but probably not by a rail based system because it, it um, but more like probably on uh, like a, a connecting shuttle basis for Raleigh Durham um, with a with an opportunity there, and then uh, the other, there are other locations as well where there's airport an interest. Those are our two largest. Um, the Piedmont Triad also has a, a large airport that might be connected with a future service as well. So definitely on our mind, uh, you know, because we we definitively believe in multimodal connections and making sure people can cross um, mode, you know, as easily as possible uh, in our systems. Absolutely. So, well, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate that. And thank you uh, to our members on the phone on uh, viewing.
And if you're not a member, please go to hsrail.org slash shirts. And uh, thank you again for, for joining us today.